Hello everybody, it's Michael Pierce here. Um, when I made the video about the Portuguese translation of Motes and Beams, um, which uh, I'll put a link to that video so you can take a look at what I'm talking about, um, it's uh, very exciting. But that was, I believe, a couple weeks ago, and I said that I had some video or audio of me talking about Fichte and Kant and their personality types or stuff related to that, and I never uploaded it because looking back over it, I just didn't like it and I found some new things in any way, so I'm just going to make a new video about the topic. And um, I'm, it's probably going to be a bit shorter, because the other one I don't even think I talk about Fichte that much. I mostly talk about Sartre, because I went on a long tangent about Sartre, and maybe I'll make a video about that, but I don't know. I just didn't really feel like it was very good. And also, even still, I am not probably qualified at all to really talk about Fichte. But I will say, in um, I'll also say that, uh, and I might have mentioned this before, um, a lot of people, myself included, often feel they need some sort of, as it were, inspiration to write. You, you can take that more sort of literally in the sense of you need to feel as though it the the breath flows through you in order to for you to feel comfortable writing it's i often uh i i really do need that but i also have found i need inspiration in order to read too because i'm a very active reader and i make lots of little notes and highlight things and i have to because otherwise i just won't absorb the material at all and so it takes a lot of effort to read and I'll read slowly, and I often don't finish things because I'm so full from just the first few pages. So all of that is to say I grabbed the wrong, uh, the wrong book. This is not my copy uh, that has Fichte. This is Heinrich Hein, which is also a very interesting fellow. So I'll go on a brief tangent about him without... Um, well, let me finish what I was saying before. Um, uh, uh, I need inspiration to read which is an interesting concept, but I think Nietzsche would be happy with me because he's one of many people who pointed out that um, reading can be just as difficult an exercise as writing in order for you to properly understand and absorb the material. I, the upside of this is because I feel I need inspiration to read, that usually means I have the benefit of reading the right things at the right time because unconscious synchronicity or something, I don't know. But if it's not the right time for me to read something, I just won't be able to get very far into it. But if it is the right time, I'll just breeze through a ton of it and make all of these connections and write all these things in the margins. Um, so anyway, all of this is meant to say that it is difficult to get myself to read something, which is why I still, after several years of saying I was going to read Fichte's Vocation of the Scholar, I still have not penetrated past like four or five pages. But those are juicy four or five pages and I'm still digesting them. So anyway, um, I'm gonna, oh, I can pause the video. Right, I forgot I could do that. Bada bing, bada boom. You people are also nice putting up with me and my antics. Um, I feel like I get more frenetic in every video because you've been watching my slow progression from from much more anxious little college boy to great, powerful, self-confident man, or <laughs> whatever I'm turning into, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so the result of that is uh, I, I ironically sound more frenetic, I think, <laughs> um, in some of my videos. Anyway, um, okay, yes. So anyway, this is a uh, German library. This has Fichte's. Uh, the vocation of the scholar, uh, or uh, some lectures concerning the scholar's vocation, um, by Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Uh, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I keep on talking about Fichte, um, I'll give you a brief history lesson. So you have Kant, wait, it's not his, look, Kant, his picture, look at that beautiful man. Um, so that's Kant. And uh, I'm just going to assume that you know who Kant is, but he was a German philosopher, and he's very, very famous. He's sort of ranked as, like, one of the most important philosophers of all time. Um, he wrote a bunch of books, and he is famous for what we're going to get into, which is the categorical imperative, um, which is an ethical principle, but we'll get into that in a moment. But anyway, you had Kant, and then sort of his immediate successor, though it's not as though they really, they didn't really know each other, um, but Fichte was like an ascended fanboy of Kant. So Fichte was another German, 
and um, Fichte thought Kant was like just the greatest thing ever, and Fichte started doing sort of, in his view, continuing on Kant's um, philosophy uh, and and his project, and so that's sort of their um, their relationship. Uh, apparently, and this is important to note. Um, Fichte, one of his first writings, I think, but it was one of his writings. Apparently, he liked Kant so much that he took on elements of his style, which was actually kind of disastrous for philosophy because Kant could be kind of opaque at times. But anyway, Fichte wrote it, and everybody just assumed, because it just sounded like Kant, that it was just another book that Kant wrote because he was such an ascended fanboy. He became his master. So anyway, you, you see how kind of tightly knit Fichte considered himself with Kant. Nevertheless, and this is why I find this case interesting, um, I believe that while I have commonly and many people type Immanuel Kant as an INTP, um, I, in my reading uh, the beginning of the scholar's vocation, which is not a lot of data, but it, it's like what Derrida said when he was showing people his library. They were like, he has all these books, and they're like, oh, have you read all of these? And he's like, no, I've read uh, two of them, but I've read those very carefully. And I think that is, that, that's just, I relate very much to that statement, unfortunately. I'm more like I have read, I have read half of all of them. I have not read all of all of them. This is one of my problems. Um, uh, well, there are a few that I have read all of, obviously. They're mostly works by Jung and Nietzsche. I've read through all of those. But, um, and some Durkheim, which is another figure I need to talk about at some point. But anyway, Fichte, uh, what was I... Shoot. What was I saying? Kant. Well, I'll, I'll follow... This is so aggravating for you guys that I, I forget what I was talking about then. I'm trying to remember. I'm going to pause while I try to remember. I remembered. The pause button is very helpful. I'll need to use that more in the future. No, sorry. Okay. So Kant, INTP. Fichte, in my opinion, INTJ. I believe Fichte was an INTJ. And so you've got that sort of similarity. They they look very similar from the, from the uh, uh, perspective of, say, the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, they have very similar external traits, but internally, the way their minds work, according to the, the theory of the Jungian cognitive functions, is actually markedly different. So it's kind of an interesting duality when you, whenever you have the types that have the, sw the swapped J and the P, um, which I've gone over all this before. But uh, when that happens, they can look very similar to, to each other, even though internally there's some very important differences that can be very, very subtle, uh, that is useful to understand. So I think this is a very good example, precisely because Fichte is a Kant fanboy. So in some sense, Fichte, and this happens a number of times, I think, where, where types will, like an INFJ will like worship an INFP author, or an INFP author will worship an INFJ author, and what will happen is they will project their own INFJ-ness or INFP-ness or whatever type they are onto the author that they like and they will interpret things that they did in this new way and that's actually a fascinating way to kind of create uh, 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 you get this sort of these creative cycles where these people think that they're copying each other when in fact they're actually creating something new but it's it's more new than if they had just been left alone. I think you see a little bit of this with Wittgenstein and Kierkegaard actually where Wittgenstein is an INFJ I believe and Kierkegaard's an INFP, and Wittgenstein is is trying to to take elements of Kierkegaard, and he's turning it. That, that's maybe another video I ought to try to, to make sometime, because that's a very interesting question. But anyway, in, we're talking about Fichte and Kant, and the main thing I want to focus on, because there's a, there's a lot of things... Well, one more point I'd like to make about Fichte, because I had not realized when reading this, uh, just this the, these first few pages of the scholar's vocation, which is, is, um, it's a series of lectures Fichte gave, um, in, in, like, 1794. And reading this, uh, I'm just like, Fichte does not get nearly enough credit. Fichte is, like, a very important figure in understanding 
philosophy after him. There were a number of ideas here, and I wish I could come up with them on the fly. But uh, the characteristic feature of the latter is multiplicity, and thus the characteristic feature of the former is complete and absolute unity. Um, that is Schopenhauer right there, is talking about the will and representation. Um, there's just a lot of things in here that I've recognized from other people's philosophies. And so that's maybe another thing to talk about at some point, is that Fichte is not is a highly, highly underappreciated philosopher. Um, because I, I rather suspect that he was a major contributor, just, just from the bulk of things in this first section. I think there's a lot of ideas that you find in, like, Sartre, and, and these people, yeah. Uh, his mere existence is the ultimate purpose of his existence. That's like Sartre right there. Um, so he is his own end. Uh, he is because he is. This quality of absolute being, of being for his own sake, is the characteristic feature, the determination or vocation of man, insofar as he is considered merely and solely as a rational being. You also have kind of Heidegger in there. So, you, so yeah, he's dealing with being, the pure I, all this good stuff. Um, I'd also like to point out that perhaps some of you already know why I'm thinking INTJ, because I associate things like one being one's own end and thinking in those kinds of terms of ends um, and trying to accomplish things and the absolute freedom of the individual subject to move forward to those things. Um, I associate that with the INTJ. I'll make another tangent here, though, because um, I have actually written uh, uh, some comments um, on if any of you are familiar with Personality Database... Um, it's a very interesting site. It's where people can go and um, just mass vote, or not, each person gets one vote, but um, they can vote on what type they think all these different historical figures are. So it's very fascinating, if only just to see what people think of figures and also to read. It, it like, collects all the data, like how many votes for each type. It has Enneagram in there. It has Socionics in there. It, it's it's actually a very well put together site. I recommend it. I haven't mentioned. I don't think I've mentioned it here on this channel because I didn't get into it until sort of the the period we've just gone through that I didn't realize how big it was that I haven't been making videos. But um, so sorry about that. Um, shoot, you see how my mind works. I I I lost the thought. Let's talk personality database. And the reason I mentioned Personality Database is I have made several lengthy comments where I have explained why I have typed some of the figures on there the way that I have. Um, and I'll put links to those in the description because um, those could probably even be turned into videos if I so desired. Why did I bring that up, though? Because Steiner, I think that's how you pronounce it. No, Sterner, sorry. Max Sterner, um, The Ego and His Own. I, I made a comment where I was saying this guy clearly seems like an INTJ. And I was surprised by um, the number of comments that were... There was one part, comment in particular that I think I need to reckon with because I think I spoke way too soon because I'm certainly not a Max Sterner expert. I was working off of just... He just came at me so strongly um, as an INTJ uh, type because he's he's talking about the ego and the ego bursting out of the central point and moving. I'm starting to wonder if my emphasis on that imagery of sort of the point and the the sort of vector forces pushing out angrily from it, whereas the opposite of that would be the information sort of being sucked in to the point. I'm wondering if I'm over reliant on that image because. I do feel like I see I'm I have an easier time recognizing what I consider to be NI types, INTJs, than I do INTPs. And so cuz cuz there's a, a couple of people uh Husserl who when I started reading Husserl I'm like INTJ. And but a lot of people say INTP. And I think I'm more likely in the wrong there, though I just just because there's so many people and a lot of these people are INTPs. And I've, I've started wondering, do I actually understand um, INTPs to the extent I'd like to? I need to look more into that. So that's all a caveat to say. I read this and I'm like, INTJ, INTJ, INTJ. But I'm starting to wonder if I am making the INTP out or have made the INTP out to be or to to think more collective collectivistically than they do um 
I know that I give that impression in the in the things that I write, and I know that that is not how many INTPs conceive of themselves. Um, they're, and they are very independent, and I don't want to give the impression that they are not independent, yet I cannot deny that there is, there is this paradox of their TI independence is reliant on this FE collectivistic side that, that they may not fully be aware of. It's, it's the sense of the, the only way in which you as an INTP are individualistic via your TI is you have to presuppose that you are in line with principles that, although you have come up with them, you believe they have a universal validity. Not, not necessarily like... It, 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 I guess I've had this problem since the very beginning with the very first INTP video I made where I, I was talking about this notion of universal validity and there were a lot of people who, who I really do believe are all INTPs who are like, no, I'm like a moral relativist, I'm all the, and they glory in this fact. And I'm like, huh, okay. And my answer at the time was to say, yes, but the way that you conceptualize the moral relativity is itself a kind of universal value. Um, so, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud on screen so you all can watch me and analyze me or whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I'm kind of in a pickle. I'm trying to figure that out. But for now, I'm going to stick with my normal way of viewing the matter. Um in order to talk about the difference between these two guys. Specifically, and this is really all I wanted to talk about, was I because I found it so delightful, is they're two very different formulations. They look the same, but they're actually very different in a very important way. Um, they're two formulations of the, quote, categorical imperative. If you don't know what that is, that is a famous thing that Kant came up with, where Kant was basically trying to figure out can we ground ethics and our morality on reason alone? Or do we always end up having to bring in these sort of external sources? In some sense, what he was trying to do, if you want to uh, typologize it, is Kant as an INTP wanted to figure out, is there a way that I can sort of rebuild ethics, but on this sort of yeah a priori foundation? Or, or can we make it... Because what the categorical imperative is, is he's saying this is this is a way that you can derive the ethical rules that we're already sort of used to and that we respect, but you can derive them logically. And the way he does it is this. And um, there's, there's many different places where he formulates it. There's sort of different formulations, but the most famous one, or at least the one that I'm using here, is from uh, Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals. Uh, and it is, let me find the spot, because I believe I marked it. It was in the aim of the groundwork, the goodwill, function of reason, the motive of duty. Terribly sorry, I should have paused the video. Categorical imperative. Here we go. Um, yeah. I'm trying to be clear about the sources here because, you know what, let me pause the video really quick just to make sure I have this. I should have had it beforehand, but I'm a professional. Okay, I'm back. Uh, that's probably a little jarring for you, where I, because there, you don't sense the time of silence as I'm making sure I have all my stuff together. I just wanted to make sure I had the right quotations. Because what I did is, I have English translations here, but I'm like, I wonder how it looks in the German. Because I want to see what they actually wrote down in the German, and I've been trying to start translating German, as you know from my translating uh, uh, the prelude to Thus Big Zarathustra. Um, so I went back to the original German. So Kant, the sort of formulation of the categorical imperative that he gives in the groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, is that is to say, I ought never to act except in such a way that I can also will that my maxim should become a universal law. So that's fancy talk for the way Kant formulates it and how it's usually understood is... I must not act unless I can, unless my sort of, to put it in typological terms, my TI formulation of my action, my TI sort of naming of the principle that I am supposedly working off of, uh, once I have made that into a principle or a maxim, I have to, it's only 
good, it is only right for me to act according to that principle if I can also will that everybody else could act as that principle. If I can say, thou shalt do this thing. Um, and the reason he's sort of trying to make this just a mere matter of contradiction is there's a whole lot of things you can use this to, to work into. Um, so the classic example is if that I learned it from is if you have a line to the ticket booth for like a theater or something, if you cut in line, Kant would say, well, what is the sort of maxim formulation, the TI formulation, if you will, of the action that you have done? Um, it is effectively, uh, I can cut in line under such and such circumstances, like, oh, because I felt like it, or something, right? Um, and Kant is like, fine, you can live according to that, but you can't stop anybody else from doing the same thing, because they are also free agents the same as you. So they could also adopt that same maxim and say, I can also cut into line. So that's what he means by making it a universal law. And the problem, of course, is that if anybody can cut into, law, into the line whenever they feel like it, then the very concept of a line is destroyed. There is no more line, it's just people all trying to get in front of each other. And so, you, you know, there's a whole lot of arguments about this of like, well, that still doesn't really work for ethics because you could just get rid of lines if you do that. I mean, you'd make that decision. But then other people are like, well, but do we really want to live? It's a whole thing, and that's not what I want to focus on. I just want to focus on the typological structure of the fact of, first of all, that he insists on being able to kind of name and articulate the, the rule in, in, in this technical language and that he feels sort of makes it unambiguous and, um, uh, well, TI-like, I think, um, and then that you'd have to universalize it from there. Now, here's where things get very interesting, my lovelies. <laughs> is, is I went into the German, because that's how I am, and um, I'm not going to try to pronounce this German, because I cannot speak German. I can, I can translate German. I don't even say I can read German, but I can translate it, uh, I think, anyway. And um, I'll put the German uh, that I found and where I found it in the description below, but... Um, and there's a little bit of this that's useful. Uh, everything is translated fine in here, but there's one word that is translated as universal. So the phrase is, uh, meine Max Maxime Zole ein Allgemeines Gesetz uh, werden. Uh, it's that word Allgemeines, ein Allgemeines Gesetz. Uh, that's a universal law. Um, Allgemeines is, is going to be important later because, and in fact, um, what was I going to do? Oh, um, the way I translated it here is, so it's, it's algemeines. It basically translates, if you translate it literally, it means all non-mine. Because mines is mine, and uh, the gay, the, the, the G-E sort of negates that, and then you have all. So it's sort of altogether not mine or universal. It belongs to everybody else. It's public property. It is not private property. It is public property. So so in some sense, he's doing a little interesting wordplay, Kant, because he's saying, my name maxime, uh, my maxim should, should an altogether not my statute become. Um, so he's, he's essentially saying we need to communize Say ah, somebody. Sorry, dumb meme. Um, we need to, <laughs> we need to uh, communize our maxims, and only then are they just. Uh, which is, in my view, a very fe thing. Kant is sort of getting in touch with his own fe. He's saying it's not just unless we can make it allgemeines, altogether not mine, a i e universal, everybody's. We are now going to compare this with Fichte's uh, approach to the categorical, categorical imperative. And the reason this is interesting is because Fichte sort of seems to unconsciously believe that he is properly quoting Kant. But he's twisting it. 
because he he's like, well, that's how Kant put it, because he's trying to make a specific point in that situation. But this is what Kant means, because I love Kant, and I believe implicitly that he was an INTJ like me. Um, so the way that, that's how I'm interpreting it anyway. So the way Fichte says is, therefore, I would express the principle of morality in the formula, which I mention only in passing and for the purpose of illustration, act so that you could consider the maxims of your willing as eternal laws for yourself. Now that's very different, and the, and, uh, the German is different too, because what he says is, um, let's see, and also das du die maxime deines Willens als erwigens gesatz uh, fertig denfen kanneft. If you listen carefully, you could hear me butchering German and making a fool of myself. I'll stop making fun of myself. I'm only doing that so that I can preempt people making fun of me, so you know that it's not because I'm confident, it's because I'm not. Um... Yeah, so the way I translate that is act so that you, the maxim of your will, as an eternal statute for yourself could think. A viges gesetz. So Kant says algemeines gesetz, altogether not my statute, whereas Fichte says a viges gesetz, um, eternal statute, and not just an eternal statute, but an eternal statute um, for Dick. For Dick, yeah, that'd be for Dick. Uh, Dick, Dick, I can't do that part. Um, eternal statute for yourself could think. So, anyway, the point being, Fichte completely uh, uh, does not make it public property. He removes the universalizing element from it. Um, almost because it's just so natural for him to do that that he's just assuming there's no way that Kant could be a brilliant philosopher if he believed this communizing nonsense. Therefore, that must not be what he means. That's just he didn't choose his words carefully. And so I'm going to put it down the way that he meant it, which is to emphasize the individual element. He, he does not reference other people in his formulation of the categorical imperative. It's not about them. He could care less whether they decided to, to take his maxim or not. He is concerned with whether it is self-consistent right? Whether it is consistent with his heart. He would not say heart, but that's how I think of it in that F-I-T-E sense. Act so that the maxim of your will uh, as an eternal statute for yourself, you could think. Sorry, I'm following the thing of the German, but you need to make it an eternal statute for yourself. You almost get hints of Nietzsche here with his notion of eternal recurrence, um, where he's in some sense saying it's not about I don't care whether other people can do it because there's sort of, um, because, you know, everybody is different. Everybody has different needs and maybe somebody needs to cut in line sometimes. And if they, you know, um, and they're not interested in trying to be friendly to the general public in that way. Um, so he's like, what I am concerned about is whether or not that would contradict something within me because, um, and in some sense, that's how he has to conceptualize it. He has to say, it's, it's not as important to me that the other people are annoyed because they don't know me. What's more important is whether or not um, my cutting in line, my saying I may cut in line, does that contradict other values which I also have, which may involve like being kind to other people or something like this. It remains as this internal, this FI process for Fichte. And so that is, so he adds in the for yourself, whereas Kant doesn't have that. Now I know that it's, it's not as though Fichte is explicitly misquoting from groundwork of the metaphysic of morals. And you, you know, you could say that I'm being a little contrived here because I'm cherry picking these two things, but I didn't cherry pick them for whatever it's worth. I just found them. I went into Kant and found the first formulation of the categorical imperative in this one, because I knew what was in here, and then I just found it in the beginning of Fichte. I did not, so I, I don't know where the other formulations are. I know there are, but I don't know where they are, so just the fact that I kind of grabbed them randomly and they line up in this way, and um, it's just sort of delicious to me. So I think, I think that's all I had. Um, I just like that comparison between the two. I think it's especially that Algemeines versus Eviges Gesatz uh, for Dick. 
um, and kind of that connection possibly with Nietzsche and the eternal recurrence is almost like a, a different formulation of the categorical imperative, but in an FI way. It's kind of an interesting theory. So, okay, I think that's all I've got. Thank you for listening to me ramble, and I hope to do more of these in the future, but I'm not going to make promises. I am working on a more official video that is uh, uh, me talking about quantum mechanics, so you can look forward to that. Um, and I'm going to do another interview with Jack Aaron with World Socionic Society sometime um, before July. So uh, we'll, I'll let you know when that's coming out. So anyway, uh, good to talk with y'all, and I will see you in the next video.